It is June 30th, and on this date, in 1955, a new television show premiered on CBS Primetime. The traditional variety show that was hosted by a relatively unknown television personality didn't do terribly well in the ratings, lasted less than a year. But the short-lived Johnny Carson show would set the stage for a much longer late-night run that became a, well, a source of joy and a cultural touchstone for millions of Americans, including me. The road that would lead to an iconic television program actually began with an accident. The Richmond, Indiana Palladium Item reported on August 19, 1954. Comic Red Skelton suffered a brain concussion and a severe neck sprain during a rehearsal for his television show, only a half hour before the program was due to go on air. While the summer of 1954 was not the height of its popularity, the weekly Red Skelton show was highly regarded, eventually running for 20 years and winning three Emmy Awards. The United Press reported the next day that Skelton was doing a stunt that called him to charge at a jail door with a piece of balsa wood made up to look like a cement block on his head. The actor rammed the breakaway door but missed the cue and it didn't break. Skelton told United Press, I dooed it too hard. While Skelton wanted to go on with the show, the UP reported that CBS decided it would go on without him, with comedian Jack Carson replacing the injured actor with less than 30 minutes notice. The rushed fill-in, Jack Carson, was 28-year-old John William Carson, a World War II Navy veteran. Paul Corkery's 1987 unauthorized biography of Carson notes that, while an ensign, Carson showed an insomniac James Forrestal, Secretary of the Navy, a card trick. The experience, Corky writes, showed Carson that he could entertain and amuse someone as cranky and sophisticated as Forrestal. So, Corkery writes, in early 1946, when he was honorably discharged from the Navy, he left thinking that maybe there was a future for him in show business. Carson went to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln on the GI Bill, majored in speech and drama, and graduated in three years. Carson worked largely in radio and by 1954 had a job in New York as a writer for The Red Skelton Show. When Skelton was injured, Corkery writes, in desperation, the show's producers called Carson at his home and told him in the legend-honored show business fashion that he would have to substitute for the stricken star. Carson started the show with a monologue which opened, personally, the way I feel right now, I think Red's doctor should be doing the show. He was, Corkery writes, a smash. The Indianapolis Star wrote on August 25th, Johnny received quite a few good press notices after his impromptu but skillful handling of Skelton's hour. The event was, the star notes, ironic, as Skelton had written a guest column on August 5th, before the accident, in which he said the wonderful thing about it is that a new comedian can be made with just one telecast. The comment was prophetic not merely because Skelton's accident would give Carson such an opportunity, but because of the sheer number of comedians who would eventually find fame because of appearances on Carson's own shows. It was Carson's appearance that would lead to the 1955 Johnny Carson Show premiering June 30th and airing Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern. The regular newspaper column by Eve Starr called Inside TV emphasized his relative obscurity at the time. The Carson Show will introduce to a national audience a particular deadpan belonging to a youngest comedian who is bound to revive the old parlor game that is the secret dread of every wit in the business. Who does he remind you of? Corkery writes that he had gone from being an anonymous voice on KNX radio to being a smash substitute for a TV star to being a nationally known personality overnight. The Johnny Carson Show didn't last a year, just 39 episodes. There are several reasons that the show never found its footing, but Corkery argues that the problem was that Carson didn't control the show himself, writing every CBS exec with a working voice box had a different idea of what to do, and each of them had a say in the program. A 1978 profile in the New Yorker magazine described the show as a half-hour program that goes through seven directors, eight writers, and 39 weeks of worsening health before expiring in the spring of 1956. But that's not to say that the show didn't leave its mark. A February 1956 edition of the Munster Indiana Times wrote that the pie throwers and the slapstick comics seem to be dying out on TV. They're being replaced by a new type of stand-up gagster who appears in a dark suit and looks like your own brother. Take Johnny Carson, for example. Well, talking about how the show was changing comedy, the article headline was Slapstick Bowing to Satirists. On Carson's show, tongue-in-cheek is king, and most of the noise comes from the band, the article quips. It notes that he appears opposite the Lux Video Drama Hour, a veteran TV show with its regular viewers, and it's his job to try to wean fans away from the drama. 
While the article says that Johnny started last summer with his network comedy show and is slowly working his way up the ratings, Carson admitted, we're gaining slowly. But added, frankly, I prefer it this way. At least I won't have so far to fall. It was, apparently, an honest assessment. The show ended the last day of March, 1956. The entertainment column The Open Mic simply stated, the sponsor has canceled. But Carson was by then no longer just Mr. Who Does He Remind You Of? He was given a daytime show called The Johnny Carson Show that ran through the summer and in September 1957 took over as host of a revamped version of the weekday game show Do You Trust Your Wife? that had originally been hosted by Edgar Bergen. Later retitled Who Do You Trust? the show kept Carson both busy and in the limelight as well as pairing him with a sidekick named Ed McMahon. A January 1960 edition of the Hackensack New Jersey Record quoted Carson, The only future I've got is that I have to do Who Do You Trust? every day at 2.30. I love doing the show and it's been very good to me. But the entertainment world had not forgotten his primetime variety show. In a bold prediction, the record continued, Carson is one of the first names you hear when someone wants to cook up a late night show a la Parr. They were referencing the Jack Parr show, originally named The Tonight Show with Jack Parr. Parr had reinvigorated NBC's Tonight Show franchise. The Museum of Broadcast Communications Encyclopedia of Television wrote that Parr became the most successful presence in late night, expanding his affiliate base from the 46 stations with which he started out to 170. Parr was popular but volatile, evidenced by a controversy in February of 1960 when he walked off the show for five weeks over an argument with censors over a joke. Parr was so essential to the show that the network kept his name on the show, despite his walking out in the middle of an episode until finally coaxing him to return. Carson had no interest in taking on the king of late night, telling the record, I wish they'd leave me alone. One of the main troubles with this industry is that as soon as somebody is successful, everybody looks for carbon copies. Jack Parr is a personality, not a format. and You can't imitate personality. The article concludes that Carson refused in 1960 and offered to take over a late night show opposite Parr. I'm not interested, he told the record. And all that seemed to have come from a crystal ball, or maybe the amazing Karnak. Carson would, of course, be tapped to take over a late-night show all apart, but he would not have to take one opposite him. In March 1962, Parr again walked away from his late-night show, this time for good, citing exhaustion over the workload. Carson was tapped to replace him, although he couldn't take over the show until his Who Do You Trust contract expired in October. The Louisville, Kentucky Courier-Journal in August of 1962 wrote, Carson is unlike Jack Parr, as tonight is unlike today. As much as Who Do You Trust had kept him in people's living rooms, it was his original primetime show that defined his new job. As a rising star in the 1950s, the future host of The Tonight Show presided over this variety show, which featured a little singing and a lot of comedy, writes TV Guide. Although it lasted less than a year, Carson must have been doing something right. Because six years later, he began his three-decade reign as the king of late-night TV. Carson perhaps most differed from Parr in that he was not as unpredictable. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote that Parr's strongest appeal was in the suspense of his unpredictability. Maybe nothing exciting was going to happen on tonight, but you couldn't be sure. Johnny Carson is a contained man. His mind and wit are quick, and he is equal to the spontaneous situation, but there's a stone wall of reserve about him that no television audience will ever penetrate. But the formula worked. The Encyclopedia of the Great Plains notes, but audiences found comfort in Carson's blandness. Three months after taking over for Parr, Carson was reaching 500,000 more homes than Parr had. The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson increased its market share year after year. Competitors came and went. But Carson remained king of the night for the next three decades, achieving a dominance unprecedented in broadcast history. Carson also offered a far more reserved political hand. The online encyclopedia of the Great Plains notes that Carson was far more tranquil than Parr, and the first critical evaluations were not in his favor. He realized, however, that a decade in fear of thermonuclear annihilation had left American television audiences ready for an escape from neurosis. History News Network of the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences of the George Washington University notes, forget socioeconomic backgrounds, Democrat or Republican, one continuity in the country for over 30 years, Monday through Friday, coming on NBC after the local news, was Johnny Carson. Catholic Bishop Robert Barron noted the importance of Carson's careful attitude towards politics on his website, Word on Fire. Carson could entertain the entire country, liberal and conservative alike. He would from time to time take light jabs at both sides in the political wars, but he never clearly identified with either party. 
The point is that the tribalism on display in late night comics represents a severe declension in the cultural situation when Johnny Carson reigns supreme. If we can laugh together, and together admit when a joke is lame, then we can perhaps reason together, compromise, listen to one another with respect. And it's just that sort of conversation that is necessary for the proper functioning of a society such as ours. Despite his careful positions, he nonetheless affected national politics in powerful ways. Kelly Childster, curator of an exhibit on Carson in the Fullerton Museum Center, told the Los Angeles Times, The show wasn't always just entertainment. It was a barometer on the State of the Union. He dealt with serious issues. Water, pollution, civil rights, women's liberation. He commented on the news. And people would tune in and see the popular culture of that day. His impact on politics was so powerful that a study published in the journal Social Science Research last August determined that his monologue had a significant effect on Richard Nixon's approval rating between 1972 and 1974. Daniel Malk of the Fullerton Museum told the Los Angeles Times, It's impossible to overestimate the influence of Johnny Carson on the entertainment industry, or for that matter, on the day-to-day -day lives of millions of Americans who watched The Tonight Show. History News Network writes that from October 1962, when Groucho Marx introduced Johnny Carson as the host of The Tonight Show, until his last show in May of 1992, the late-night talk show host and comedian had a major impact on American culture, and not just television. When he played Twister on air with actress Ava Gabor in 1966, the, the website of the History Channel explains sidekick Ed McMahon worked the spinner and guffawed from his couch as Carson and Gabor, wearing a low-cut gown, got down on all fours and contorted in strange positions. The stars were in knots. The audience was in stitches. Sales of the game skyrocketed. In 1973, when a member of Congress worried that a shortage of wood pulp might result in a toilet paper shortage, Carson joked in his monologue, There's an acute shortage of toilet paper in the good old United States. We gotta quit writing on it. CBS recalled in 2020, the false alarm sent Carson's audience of almost 20 million running. Filmmaker Robert Gersten told CBS, People all over the country stormed supermarkets, grabbed as much toilet paper as they possibly could. Newspapers noted a shortage across the country, driving Carson to make a clarification a month later. For all my life in entertainment, I don't want to be remembered as the man who created a false toilet paper scare. Apparently, there is no shortage. His impact was truly astounding. History News Network explains Carson was not a simple celebrity, not simply a transient personality saturated throughout the media one day and gone just as suddenly. No. Johnny Carson was a social and cultural centerpiece of society for multiple generations of Americans for more than 30 years. In the future, just as historians have gleaned specifics of daily life in the past from personal letters, journals, and library archives, one will be able to have a fair gauge of much of the general United States between the early 1960s and the early 1990s by viewing tapes of The Tonight Show. The New York Times said of him in 2005, During those three decades, he became the biggest, most popular star American television has known. Virtually every American with a television set saw and heard a Carson monologue at some point in those years. At his height, between 10 million and 15 million Americans slept better weeknights because of him. He literally transformed the entertainment industry. United Press reported in 2005, even his decision to move The Tonight Show from New York to Burbank, California in 1972 helped move the TV entertainment business center of gravity from the East Coast to the West. In his time, the highest salary performer in television history, the Encyclopedia of the Great Plains notes that he was so important to NBC that when he mentioned that he might retire from The Tonight Show in the summer of 1979, stock prices of NBC parent company RCA dropped precipitously. And he impacted careers in politics, in writing, and of course in comedy. History News Network notes a master of the monologue, Johnny Carson was solely responsible for launching so many careers, far too many careers to even begin to mention. In a 1992 edition of the Los Angeles Times, movie star Burt Reynolds credited appearances on Carson for much of his success, including getting him his role in The Deliverance. Comedian David Brenner told the Times, in 18 months as a comic, I'd only made $8,000. That all changed in less than 24 hours. By the end of the business day after I did Carson, I had $10,000 in jobs. The entertainment website The Things explains, Today, The Tonight Show primarily attracts guests who are already big stars, but back in the old days when it was hosted by Johnny Carson, it was a common for budding stars and unknowns to make their television debut on the show. The key to a successful run on The Tonight Show back then was one rule. Make Johnny laugh. If you make Johnny Carson laugh, and if he invited you over to the couch, you were pretty much guaranteed to become the next big star. 
Last year, the Things gave a partial list of comedians who got their start that way. Andy Kaufman, George Carlin, Louis Anderson, Jim Carrey, Bill Maher, Eddie Murphy, Ellen DeGeneres, Roseanne Barr, Jay Leno, Drew Carey, Jerry Seinfeld. Another late-night legend, David Letterman, told the United Press in 2005, He gave me a shot on his show, and in doing so, he gave me a career. All late-night talk show hosts who came after Carson, Letterman said, were pretenders. It isn't as if Carson, who has often been described as mercurial, didn't have his personal foibles or that there were no controversies around him. This isn't a, a biography of Johnny Carson. It's a note on the impact that this one television show had in 30 years of late night dominance. And it's not as if Johnny Carson has forgotten history. There's a whole YouTube channel where you can watch full episodes of the show that's dedicated to bringing him to a modern audience. And purportedly, there is a television biopic series based on his career in the works. But the magazine National Review noted in 2017, a quarter century ago, a case could be made that Johnny Carson was better known than the President of the United States. But for millennials raised on a different set of late-night hosts... Johnny Carson is yet another figure in American history they aren't taught about. Okay, so once again, this is nostalgia. Yeah, I watched an awful lot of Carson. I was watching live on May 22nd, 1992, when he signed off. Brought a tear to my eye when he said, I am one of the lucky people in the world. I found something I always wanted to do, and I have enjoyed every minute of it. I can only tell you that it's been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. I cried again on January 23rd, 2005, when I heard news of his passing at the age of 79. I cried because I remembered all the times that he made me laugh. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.